So for this talk, um, since this is a 50 minute slot, I will start by giving a 25 minute talk that I've given before. That was actually, uh, it, it does uh, a lot of good things to kind of set up the, the scope of the project and, and the aim. And it was given before, uh, before launching uh, the balloon into space. And then afterwards uh, will be kind of a story time, a little bit of a slideshow, never before seen uh, photos, never before told stories, and never before seen demo. And uh, hopefully that will go well. So how do I progress my slides? There we go. Uh, my name is Pavel Shumchkovsky. I'm from Las Vegas, Nevada. I work for an online uh, polling company called Wedgies, and this talk, as most of my talks, have absolutely nothing to do with work, so thanks to those guys for letting me come out here uh, and, and do this. Um, if you're not familiar with the, uh, the Polish pronunciation of names, I've provided an emoji pronunciation guide. Um, so if, it's, uh, if you can do, if you can say pa bell shrimp chick coffee ski, that is a pretty good approximation. Um, and on Twitter, I'm at Makinai. Um, probably haven't heard of me, but if you have, for any reason, it's probably because of this guy right here. It's a, it's a sumo bot kit. Um, I came up with the design for it uh, a few years ago for uh, a, a Node Bots event, which is basically uh, controlling robots with Node.js. Uh, made it for Node Bots Vegas. Um, and it's popped up at a bunch of other events because it's open source, so it's really easy to laser cut. And, um, and even Microsoft used it to demo the Raspberry Pi at, uh, at San Mateo Maker Fair, which is weird, but, but pretty cool. Um, I've also contributed a chapter to this, uh, this JavaScript book featuring, uh, JavaScript robotics book featuring lots of really much cooler uh, JavaScript robotics people than me, but I was honored to be included in it. Um, I wrote a chapter on uh, Delta robots in JavaScript. Cool, so why space? Why indeed? Well, space is really cool. It's strange and alien, and it's remote and, and hard to get to. Um, it's fascinating. It maybe holds the key to life itself, and it's just endlessly captivating. Um, I also watched a lot of Star Trek The Next Generation when I was a kid, so that might have been an influence. It's sort of the sci-fi theme. Um, I don't know, previous generations had Apollo missions to inspire them, and mine was like, oh, we had TNG. It's pretty good. Um, there's also kind of a, I felt like a gap in the uh, JavaScript powered thingies, um, I guess, ecosystem. So we have uh, the upper left logo there is, uh, is node bots, so robots, and we had node boats at, uh, at, uh, at JSConf. OpenROV is a JavaScript powered uh, submarine. Um, node copters on the bottom left. There's node rockets, but they don't go all the way up. They just, they're air compressor powered, so they go up and then they fall down really fast. Um, so what's the, what's the final frontier is, is space. So I was like, yeah, let's, let's do that. Um, I also really wanted to try it because it's, it's not easy to do. It's, it's hard. There's a lot of aspects to it. Beyond just programming, there's, you know, hardware aspects. There are, uh, there's, you have to get licensed, well, at least for, for this, uh, this thing that I did, you have to get a, a, a ham radio license. Um, it involves car chases and planning and uh, learning regulations and, and all these things that are just, it's a challenge and I like challenges. So I thought it'd be fun to do. Um, that said, I, I think it is, well, I know it's, it is possible, um, as long as you set some specific goals and, and stay realistic about them. So um, let's talk about what those goals would be. Uh, so goal number one, pretty obvious, is to get something really, really high. This is kind of the pretending to be an astronaut uh, goal and you know, if you if you if you don't go really high, you can't get into space. Kind of a no-brainer. Um, so, how do you do that? There are some options. There's drones, but they're heavily regulated right now. They don't quite go high enough. I think the limit is now 400 feet or something like that. Um, there are high-powered rockets, like really big. Explosive, scary rockets, not like the SDs, uh, Boy Scout rocket kits uh, that go up, but, but they make really big ones and they go really high and they, you know, go past the stratosphere, but, but they come down and they, you know, they go really fast and they tend to explode and they're dangerous. So, um, but balloons are an option. 
Um, so high altitude balloons uh, have been around since about the 1700s and compared to drones and things, the regulations, the federal, the US Federal Code of Regulations actually has a subsection on them um, in the uh, FAA regulation subsection. I used to have that memorized, it's subsection D, it's got like five or six numbers and sections in it. Um, and the rules are, are surprisingly lax because they have been around for a while. Um, the restrictions are basically, you have to launch on a clear weather day uh, with, with good visibility. In Las Vegas, it's pretty much always cloudless skies, so that's not a problem. You have to launch, you can't launch a nearby a heavily populated area, so drive out of the city. We have a lot of barren land in Vegas as well, like lots of desert landscapes, uh, which you'll see later on as well, so that's perfect. Uh, you can't launch near an airport or military base, that's fine, you just avoid those things. Um, you have to, or you should, uh, call the air traffic control and let them know about two hours before you launch so they know what to look out for. It has to be in a reflective, radar reflective thing. The balloon in a, in a foil covered box is good enough. It's not hard. You can't trail any, any antenna or anything for longer than 50 feet. It's pretty easy. Uh, the one, the one I'm, I'm working on is, uh, is pretty short comparatively. And anything that, that goes up has to break with less than 50 pounds of braking force. So just in case, uh, just in case a, a plane or something crashes into it, it'll just break apart and it won't cause any damage. Um, as well, you have to have two ways of getting it down or, or boarding the mission. And opinion is varied on this, but one of them is if it goes high enough, it pops. You know, and that's that's one way. Another way is usually a cut down system, where you have a timer and a uh, a cord cutter, which is a gun power propelled. A little bullet that goes through a cord and can cut loose of the balloon after a certain timeout. Um, so these are all these are all doable things. Um, come on, there you go. So this is an example of a high altitude balloon that you can launch up. The, the balloon is at the top. It's um, it's much larger than this. It's a meteorological balloon or a weather balloon. Um, they sell these in weight rather than volume. Um, but the concept is basically the same. A 650 gram balloon will hold a lot more gas than a 250 gram balloon. Um, and you fill it with, with some gas that's lighter than air. Usually it's helium or hydrogen. Um, hydrogen is explodey, so it's maybe to be avoided. There's a helium shortage, so, um, so it's a little bit more expensive, but it's safer and it's not, it's not that bad. It's maybe, um, $280 or so, you have to buy a, a, a massive tank or maybe you can find some place to rent you one and then about $70 worth of, of helium. So that's totally doable. It's not too much of an investment um, for a lot of people. Um, you can see the, uh, the line going there along the bottom. In the middle, that orange thing is an approximation of a parachute. And at the bottom, the little silver box is the payload. So that's just a fancy-ish term for a box that holds things that you want to go up into the air. Um, but do they go high enough to count as, uh, as space? In fact, yes. Um, so there's an area of the upper or the lower atmosphere called near space that starts at around 65,000 feet. Um, at that level, you can start to see the curvature of the Earth. It's also pretty fascinating in that um, at 65,000 feet is, is an area or a, a cutoff known as Armstrong's limit. Um, which is a very low pressure area, and it's so low pressure that humans can't survive uh, there without a pressure suit. Um, in fact, at body temperature, water will start to boil at that, uh, at that elevation, at that pressure level. So it's pretty interesting. Um, it's not named after Neil Armstrong. It's named after, I think his name is Harry Armstrong. He was a, a Navy doctor who discovered it or treated somebody for conditions. That photo there is taken at about 100,000 feet, and you can clearly see sort of the division between, you know, where space starts and where Earth is, and you can see the curvature. It's uh, really fascinating. Um, and uh, as I said, it starts at 65,000 feet. High altitude balloons, I think the record for, for one of these is about 120,000 feet, so it uh, can easily reach that area. Okay, goal number two. Um, I guess the best possible thing would be to go up there yourself. Um, but since that, I, I know Red Bull's done it with like a 100,000 foot manned balloon. It was really cool, the guy went up in a, in a pressure suit. Um, but that's a little bit ambitious for, for me and, and my group of friends that worked on this project. Um, so the next best thing is just to send some sensors up there, collect some data, and uh, you know pretend to do science-y things. So 
that's achievable. Um, why JavaScript? Well, um, I, I'm a JavaScript developer, um, and it seemed like a good fit, but mostly it's because of, of uh, this guy right here. Johnny5 is a really awesome JavaScript library for controlling hardware devices. Um, it simplifies things a lot, and it lets you use kind of a language that you're already familiar with to, to make difficult things easier. Um, so love that library. In fact, it's the reason that I got into JavaScript in the first place. I was always kind of a, a Ruby person. I learned about node bots, and that really swung me over to, uh, to this side of things. Um, for a long time, it was uh, only possible to do um, to use Arduinos with Johnny5, uh, which meant that, um, so the way, the way Johnny5 works is there's a special firmware that lives on the hardware device uh, called Fermata. You install that instead of your regular Arduino program, so you're not writing in C, but you upload the Fermata. And then uh, your computer, uh, the, the JavaScript client, will talk to that uh, using the Fermata protocol. So it can turn off different ports and control devices, things like that. But that means you have to have a laptop connected to uh, to the Arduino with, uh, with a, a USB cable, and it's a little bit hard to send up a laptop, or maybe it's just heavy. Um, that was until uh, maybe about two years ago or so. Um, Johnny5 adopted a, a module-based system, including uh, one uh, written by Brian Hughes um, to, uh, to install Johnny5 directly on a Raspberry Pi. Raspberry Pi is basically a small computer, um, it has these GPIO ports that are used to connect uh, simple devices, and it supports uh, I squared C, which I'll talk about in a little bit. And that really made this possible was was the ability to have sort of an autonomous install of Johnny Five on this little tiny, tiny computer. Um, if you've worked with Arduino before, or have worked with uh, with little sensors and things that are not. Uh, more complex things like USB devices. Um, you, uh, you, you know that usually they work on so, sort of like a ground pin and a signal pin. And if you have a lot of sensors on a, on, on a, on a device, you might need a lot of pins. Um, but there's, uh, if, if you haven't seen I squared C, um, it is a more complicated uh, protocol for controlling certain sensors. Uh, and it only uses four uh, signal pins for, for any kind of sensor. So it has like a ground, a, uh, a signal pin, a clock, and something else. I don't know what it's for. Um, but, but it's a lot like USB or, or maybe SCSI. Um, and you can chain the devices together. And Johnny5 uh, has support for a lot of I squared C devices that are really easy to implement. You just chain them all together. I think that I have a picture later. Yeah, here you go. The I squared C bus. Um, so here it's wired up to a couple of different, a uh, few different types of sensors. I believe um, one of them is uh, BMP180 from SparkFun. It's a barometric pressure sensor. Um, the other one is a six degree, um, I, I guess you'd call it an IMU. It's, uh, it's, a, it's a motion sensor, so it includes an accelerometer and a gyroscope. It can detect different types of movements. And I believe the last one is an electronic compass. Um, so it can detect orientation. So they're all kind of wired together on a single bus. They're all modules. You just plug them in. It doesn't. It doesn't really uh, involve a lot of soldering or a lot of complicated things, building custom boards. Um, and so this is all kind of cobbled together by looking at the devices that uh, that are there for for Johnny Five and just picking those. And so there's there's a lot of uh, data inputs possible with that. Reading the sensor data. Um, here's a code sample using uh, Johnny5 to read, uh, to read the temperature and I guess a few other things, let's see. This one's specifically using the barometer module from the BMP160. These are all kind of cribbed from the Johnny5 repo. They have fantastic docs. It's as simple as this. Uh, you set, you uh, initialize the device. I think above this somewhere, I'm telling it specifically that it's a Raspberry Pi, but depending on what type of board you're using, it'll be slightly different, but those docs are all there on the individual board drivers as well. You set up a listener. Whenever there's new data, it'll, 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 uh, it'll call you back. And here I'm just adding it to an, um, an object called current data. So I can collect all the data. And then in order to, to combine that data and, and log it and store it somewhere, I'm a fan of using tools that I know and that I'm familiar with. 
and I come from the web world. Uh, so Winston is a popular logging uh, software for, a lot of people use it for Node.js applications and things like that for, for, for web apps, for logging requests and error messages and it supports log levels, but also support, supports JSON data. Um, which is very useful, very easy to parse for this type of thing. So I'm just setting up a Winston logger and logging it. It gives me a free timestamp. Um, every half second I log whatever data packet I'm getting and just save it down to a file. So it's, it's really simple, the, the data collection, um, using Raspberry Pi components and, and logging software. Here's a sample of what that log line looks like. Um, so I'm just sort of grouping it by, by components for ones that have multiple sensors. The accelerometer um, has X, Y, Z acceleration, pitch, the angle, and uh, the roll. Um, inclination orientation is a lot like cell phone orientation. So I think like one is like this and negative one means upside down. I don't remember how that one goes actually. Um, gyroscope uh, controls not force but kind of rotation as well. Uh, the heading there is from the, uh, the compass, so it provides both a, a heading in degrees, um, map degrees, where zero degrees is north, as well as a human readable uh, direction. And these are all just provided by the, by the Johnny Five uh, drivers for these things. Pressure is a barometric pressure in kilopascals, temperature, um, and the timestamp is free, like I mentioned. Um, you will want to not only collect numeric data, which is fine and all, but, but it'd be great to see what's going on up there. There's a, a Raspberry Pi camera that just plugs right into the Raspberry Pi. It comes with built-in software uh, on, on most uh, Raspberry Pi installations. So I think there's uh, Raspbian is the default uh, Linux distribution that, that they recommend, the Raspberry Pi Foundation recommends. It comes with command line tools, and there's a great uh, NPM module that wraps those command line tools. It can do still video, photos, it can even do slow motion video if, you, if you'd want to use it. Um, it's as simple as uh, plugging it in, installing the NPM module, and, uh, and doing, uh, and hitting record on the, uh, or uh, calling a record method and giving it a file name. So it can capture uh, a lot of things quite easily. If you add a, uh, a USB memory stick, they have really tiny 128 megabyte memory sticks. You can record hours of videos really easily uh, using that. Uh, goal number three is, uh, is a big one, and that's getting, you, you can send something up fairly easily. Uh, it's not actually that hard. You take a balloon, you shoot it up, it's fine. It'll go up. Um, the hard part is getting it back. Uh, otherwise, it's all for naught because you'll have all this data and cool photos on, on the USB and, and, uh, and on the SD card and everything, but, but it's no good to you because you, you don't have it. So um, there's, a, there's a website uh, called habhub.org, and it stands for High Altitude Balloon Hub. It's based out of the UK. It has a, a really good calculator um, where you can input, um, well, it's a, it's a Google Maps interface. So you pinpoint where you want to launch from, you input um, the, the weight of your payload, so the weight of the balloon and, and, and all the stuff uh, that it comes with, um, how much pulling force, uh, like basically how much helium you're gonna put into the balloon, so it'll know the ascent rate, and uh, your descent rate, which is usually you wanna shoot for about five meters per second for, for a safe descent, um, and that, that varies with your payload weight and the size of the parachute that you put on the device. Um, and it will take into consideration uh, current weather conditions. You plop it down the map, and it'll predict where your balloon is likely to burst. That's that sort of explodey mark in the middle um, right there. And where it's likely to descend and land. I think this is over Berlin. It has nothing to do with, uh, with, uh, with the most recent launch we did, but it's a fantastic tool. Um, so I recommend you use that one. But that's still a best guess. Weather can change really, really, really frequently. Uh, depending on the area you're in, and it can drift miles and miles off course, so you can't use this alone. There could be a, just a giant bird that comes and takes your balloon and sweeps it away. Never know. Um, so you're going to want to have more accurate location tracking. This is a Venus GPS module. It's on SparkFun. I think it's about $70 or so, and then you can add a, an antenna to it. Um, so this is like a GPS on your phone. It gives you your latitude, longitude, uh, altitude, and the time that comes down from, uh, from the satellite system. Uh, currently, I don't think Johnny5 supports this natively, but I'm working on that. 
Um, so, so it's great for determining where your location is, but it's still sort of rooted on the, uh, the Raspberry Pi and, and there's no easy way to, to get it to you without some sort of an uplink. Um, so you're gonna wanna use some sort of radio system to get to you. Uh, Wi-Fi, the range is not good enough because we're talking about you know, 100,000 feet. XB, it's not good enough, um, but there is um, shortwave radio. Uh, can do it. This is um, this is like ham radio. The kind of people who um, will will hang out, you know, in their their basement in in like Oklahoma and use the ionosphere to bounce uh, radio messages to Iceland and and just sort of things like that. So it can travel great distances, but it requires uh, licensing in order to operate. So uh, my three friends and I actually. Um, just sort of crammed for the for the the most basic level of ham radio uh, license, the technician class license. I think we studied for maybe about a week or two. Uh, went to the exam, took the test. It was about twenty bucks or so, and passed. Um, so it's not difficult. Uh, there's study guides that give you basically all the answers. You can just memorize the answers, and uh, and get it. The, the problem is even knowing the answers and the questions. We didn't really learn anything useful about ham radio like don't know how any of it works still it's still kind of a mystery uh but luckily you're now licensed to operate on these these these, these restricted frequencies um and that's all we really needed at that time um there's a, a specific um technology within within ham radio called aprs um i think it's called automatic position relay Thank you. Or is it not is it position really okay? Yeah, cool. Um, and it basically uses um, data packets sent on a specific frequency. I think in the states it's like one four four point three nine zero megahertz. Um, and uh, a lot of the ham radio happens uh, via via voice because it's like audio transmission. But this takes these data packets and encodes them kind of like uh, like a modem where you know it does screeches at twelve hundred baud. Um, it's a technology called ASFK 1200, which stands for. Okay, I think it's. I think it's. I think it's audio shift frequency keying or something, which is basically the same thing as a modem. And so you have like a short blip of a packet that goes, and that is uh, that little packet. I think I have it somewhere on the the next slide, an example of what the the decoder packet looks like. But you just send out these these frequencies, and you have. Uh, a, a radio down on, on the earth and it can pick up these frequencies and you can figure out where it is from there. And there are these digital repeaters all over um, that you can route, route your packets to, uh, to receive them. So once you get above a certain altitude, um, which I found out is 4,000 feet uh, where I am, uh, it, the, this will start getting picked up and routed to, to the internet. So it's, it's really cool. Um, the, the technology stack for this is maybe kind of complicated and I originally wanted to just write everything from scratch, write my own, you know, um, ASFK encoder and write my own uh, driver for the, uh, for the, for this, this guy right here, which is a, a, a transceiver that's tuned to the specific frequency and, uh, and the GPS and everything. But I realized that there's a lot of other things to, to worry about first. So I was like, maybe I can find something off the shelf. And as it turns out, there's a really good project uh, that does this off the shelf called Trackwino. Um, it's Arduino software and schematics um, to basically take uh, GPS signals from this specific GPS module and encode them and send them out using this transceiver. Um, so they have really nice schematics that, that's a, that you can get your circuit board made um, on one of the, I forget the, the purple circuit board makers, but there's places where you, I uh, Osh Park, I think. You can send the schematics off to them, they'll send you back this circuit board and you buy these surface mount components and, and you put it together and it looks all professional. Um, but I didn't do that, I just kind of stuck it on a bunch of different boards on a spark fun shield and it, it's pretty simple um, and I cut a lot of corners on this one. Uh, just soldered on the, um, the GPS module itself and it needs a, a voltage regulator because the GPS operates at three volts versus five volts. Um, and the, the transceiver. So the real version is really nice and compact. This one's kind of hacked together, but it does run on an Arduino, uh, not, not using JavaScript, but you can talk to this using serial, uh, which I will talk about, I think, in the next slide, maybe. 
maybe not. Maybe I'll talk about it later. Um, anyway, once you are able to transmit your signal to these digital repeaters, there is a, uh, a great service on the web called APRS.FI, which is a, you know, automated position reporting system, was it? Uh, a tracking website. And so they, they read all of the data over this APRS. You know, the digital repeaters basically take in your, your signal that you transmitted and route it via TCP so it goes into this public um, APRS channel and they pick up all the little dots. All of those little dots on there are um, either stations, uh, receivers, or, or things that are moving around. Um, so the different icons mean different things. Um, I don't think mine is on there, but this is all the stuff around my area that, that picks up uh, the area where I live. And uh, right below that picture is an example of a, uh, an APRS packet. So that first thing there, KG7OXY11, is my call sign uh, with dash 11, which designates the type of thing that you're broadcasting from. It's like, it's encoded. So one is a, is a station or digital repeater. Um, there's one for a car, which is, I don't remember, maybe eight. 11 is specifically designated for high altitude balloons. Um, the Y2 there is a, a routing path, which um, basically it, uh, it specifies which type of receivers are, are allowed to receive it and whether they should uh, move it on or not. And then it's followed by uh, the encoded GPS um, positions, the, the latitude and longitude, and A equals is the altitude. Um, the TI, everything uh, starting after the slash after A is a, is a comment field. Um, so this specific um, track we know unit uh, tries to encode the temperature and something that starts with TI and V on there. I don't know what that stuff is, but I don't have those sensors on my board, so it's, it's garbage. Um, and then Rofl Doge is just like a comment I put on there to test. Um, so that's what that looks like. Um, and then uh, goal number four is just to just to do it, just get everything together, put all the, the things together, and uh, and do it. And I hadn't done that at the time of this talk yet. Um, but here is the uh, the entire payload. Um, so basically, uh, it's um, the the antenna on top uh, screws into the uh, the transceiver, which is that tan board right there. Um, it's connected just via some cabling to the track we know normally in the, the nice version that's directly on board. And then I have a serial cable connecting the Raspberry Pi to the, to the Arduino so those can talk and I can pull data off of it and, and power it through that as well. Next to the, the red thing, which is uh, the, the Arduino, is uh, a Raspberry Pi camera. The Raspberry Pi itself uh, connected to a one of these... Um, you know, cell phone recharging batteries is just fine for, for powering that. And then the, uh, the sensor array below that. Um, so that's kind of unassembled, uh, everything that's, that's going up. Um, I, I maybe mentioned that, uh, um, well, this stuff is kind of hard to test. For a long time, we were stuck on just trying to get digital repeaters to pick up the signal um, to see if we would even be able to track it at least from ground level, we weren't able to get any digital repeaters. I tried doing some tests with drones, maybe even flying slightly above the, the uh, FAA regulation, but it was all for naught, because even, even, even on this, this particular drone, it can go up to maybe like 1,000 feet. Uh, it was not enough to pick anything up, um, which was unfortunate. But um, I was able, driving around one day, just to get something to pick it up, so that was like the proof of concept. We even built our own uh, ground receiving station, I guess a digital repeater with like a laptop and a software defined radio and it worked on that but it wouldn't work anywhere else. So it was kind of like fingers crossed and let's hope it works for real. Um, drone test was not useful. It was fun but not useful. Um, so this is a false ending um, because uh, here's where we're going to take off on the next slideshow but thanks to, uh, to my friends that helped me out with this. Um, uh, this all started out as a kind of a, a hackathon project at a uh, place um, some of us still work um, uh, called Zappos, and, and, uh, and a lot of us have moved on, but we kept going. So this has been going on for about a year, this particular project. Um, and I do have uh, these JS and Space stickers, and there's someone on the swag table if you want them. But let's move into the next presentation. Let's see, how do I get out of this? Exit presentation mode. Um, so these slides aren't as pretty, and I apologize for that, but most of the, uh, uh, oops, pretend you didn't see any of this. 
Okay. Um, most of this data is about uh, like pretty much everything in this presentation is 10 days old or so. And there, there was my son's birthday after that and Halloween. And so kind of threw together uh, and, and spent more time analyzing the data than putting this presentation together and creating a cool demo. Uh, so again, I apologize for the quality of the slides. Um, but here's what the, uh, the, uh, the assembled payload, all that stuff you saw looks like inside of the box. Um, so the box itself is made out of sort of like a styrofoam that has reflective coating on one side. I have no idea what it's meant for. I think it's building insulation or something, but I found this big piece of styrofoam behind uh, our hacker space in Vegas, and I was like, this is perfect, let's, let's just use this. So we cut it up and, uh, and just glued it together. Um, and the reason you want styrofoam is because it gets really cold um, in, 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 at that altitude, and things like lithium ion batteries tend to stop working at that height, so you want to have something that'll insulate them. Um, it's got lots of pretty blinky lights in there. Um, in the end, the transceiver ended up, uh, the antenna of the transceiver ended up poking out the bottom, but it's, it's, it's pointed up here. Um, so this is sort of the insignia of the project, this JS in space logo, one of them anyway, uh, on the side of the box. And you can see the reflective coating, which is, or it's meant to be pretty easy to see, and it's definitely radar reflective. Um, the, the mission patch, which was designed uh, at Zappos by another coworker there, uh, on, on the top, and the, there's the GPS antenna, which is mounted externally and just glued to the side. It's on a little cable. The little box on the bottom contains the Raspberry Pi camera poking out the bottom. And uh, remember this little cardboard square right there. It'll become important later. If I don't remind you, or if I don't bring it up, remind me of it at the end of the presentation. Um, we'll take a look. Okay. Um, so this is us sort of setting up and staging for, for the launch. Um, this is, I don't know, maybe 60, 70 miles outside of Vegas, nearby a city called Pahrump. We just looked for, um, we actually staged everything uh, on the morning of, of the launch. We met up and uh, ran the Hab Hub predictor to figure out what would be the ideal place to launch so it would land in a place that we could easily access it. Um, so you don't want it to land on top of a mountain or in the middle of a military base. So we just waited for the weather to be as accurate as possible and picked this place, which is actually um, really close to the driveway of like a pretty famous shooting range in Las Vegas. Um, and there's a tarp on the ground, and uh, that big green thing is the helium tank. Um, and here we're kind of, um, I guess, getting the wrinkles out of this, this sheet. Um, so the sheet is to, uh, to make it easier to hold the balloon down. You normally don't want to touch the balloon with your, your hands or kind of, they're kind of gentle because it's a very thin latex. And so people recommend wearing gloves and it's hard to hold this massive balloon down without touching it all over. Um, not to mention protecting it from cactuses and weird things. So we use a sheet to hold it down while we're inflating. Um, this is about the size of the balloon when it launched. So we'd already taken the sheet off and we were just like posing and holding it down until the launch. You can see the, the orange thing is the parachute and the payload is sort of floating there right around here. There goes the balloon, it's let go. So it's officially launched and nobody's touching it. And then it's going and that's a good shot. It's a pretty good approximation of the uh, of the balloon uh, in the, the previous presentation. You can see the antenna hanging down there, going, almost gone. Um, and this is APRS.FI. So um, we had a sort of a sort of a ground station where we could receive the, the, the packets from, from the balloon, and at least hear the but didn't have a good way of decoding it on a computer. So we ended up Basically, there's this software for Mac called ASFK 1200. They run, and um, we were basically using it using a pair of headphones, like an acoustic coupler. So we taped the headphones to the uh, to the hand ham radio, and it was very finicky, but it would decode the packets sometimes. But once it got above 4,000 feet, it started tracking, and so we were using uh, APRS.FI's mobile website to track the balloon. Um, and you can see there that red line is the course that it's taking. Um, and at the end of the, the, the red line is a house. Um, so found out about this, but um, in, in APRS packets, there's apparently a symbol table where you can choose the different kind of icons. There's one for like a car, and there's one for uh, a high altitude balloon and a hot air balloon, in fact, but had the default one, which is a house. So now it's like this 
house flying around at, uh, <laughs> at whatever the altitude was here. Um, but once it's launched, there was not much left to do. It was up there for about two hours, so we just went to In-N-Out Burger and, and grabbed food. These are my friends that, uh, that did the project with me. Uh, that's Ty, Matt, and Dan. So thanks to those guys. So we're just like chilling, watching the the balloon on our on our uh, on our cell phones, and like talking excitedly about it. People were looking at us weird. It was fine. Uh, I think we were yelling out like right around here was maybe where it hit like eighty thousand feet, and we were really, really excited because it meant it was it you know it got to the goal. Um, so that was cool. Um, and as it says, now to Google Earth. So I'm going to show you because this is better at visualizing than APRS def. Uh, FI, the uh, the flight path that it took. So this is kind of kind of where it was. Let me see if I can zoom in. There's definitely some really good angles. You can see. Oh, uh, I should zoom out actually, and tell you that that is. Oops. Behind that trail is Las Vegas proper. Um, this is the area we launched right here. Can you see my mouse cursor by the way? Yeah. Um, that is where we launched. Um, if I zoom in, lost my mouse, there it is. It's really easy to lose your mouse here. There you can see kind of like the altitude profile, how high it went, I think, oh, there, there, there it goes. So it flew up really high to, um, this was, possibly it made it to 100,000 feet, but we're not sure because it was only sending the data packets every 60, I think it was like between 30 and 50 seconds or so. And so it went to like 99, uh, 999, 121. And the next packet we got was descending. And so I have no way of figuring out if it, if it actually went as high uh, as, as 100,000, but that's pretty, pretty close. So, wow, it was really easy to lose your mouse cursor. Where's my mouse cursor, anybody see it? Go upper left, and is it invisible now? Okay, here we go. And I don't know why it's. Uh, this is kind of impossible to trackpad. There we go. Rotate, zoom. Okay. So. This will give you kind of a good idea. It was heading down this way, uh, pretty much right into these mountains. Uh, so if it had landed on that mountain, that would have been really troublesome to get. And then right back here is the Colorado, Colorado River. So if it had landed in the river, that would have been really troublesome as well. Uh, but fortunately, there was some wind that blew it off the mountains and went this way. So it turned around, and uh, right here is where we lost the ability to track it at about 4,000 feet. Um, so it was kind of a trick to find it. We, we drove out to where the last signal was received. Um, and luckily, like really, really luckily, there is this, uh, this service road right here, this, this, uh, all, all along the lines of this, uh, of this service road were a bunch of power lines. Um, so we, the main highway is like way down here. Come on. Wow. That looks really far. Okay, there's the highway. So this is a highway to a place called Nelson, and there is this dirt service road, like really nearby to where it was, um, where it was last seen, and it was gated, and we were really depressed, but we drove a little bit further, and there was another one that was fine. It was just like, a gate was open, and it said limited use, you know, don't, don't shoot at things here, and that was fine. So we drove all the way up to the service road and spent the remainder of the day looking for, uh, for this, this balloon uh, and didn't end up finding it. Um, went home and we're like, right, we'll try it next weekend. This is on a Saturday. Let me see if I have more photos here. I don't remember what the next slide is. Okay, well there's, there's, the, uh, there's the service road. You can see the power lines and everything. Um, so next day rolls around. It turned out I had kind of an extra day um, and we were all pouring over the, the data, which we had pulled down from APRS to FI. It does a data export, and it does this export of, um, of, of Google Earth KML data. So we figured out that it was at 4,000 feet. Um, it, it told us the, um, the heading, which was two, 260 degrees. Um, it was heading. We knew it was going nine miles an hour, and we knew it was falling at about 
um, maybe 5.25 meters a second. So figured out that it was gonna be in the air for about four and a half minutes or so, which put it in, in, uh, in a half mile radius from here. And I just kind of guessed um, that it would be, I think this is the first guess right here. It'd be right about there if it kept going on the, on the current trajectory. And then the second guess was like, I didn't know about compass declination, which apparently like GPSs and magnetic earth pole, are like at slightly different declinations. There's like a 15 degree difference where we are in Vegas and depending on which part of the earth you're in, it's, it's different. So just, just to be safe in case I didn't understand, remember I don't know what I'm doing. I, I also uh, made a second guess it would be there. Um, and then just ended up hiking back and forth along this desert. I think the route is here. Let's see. So that's the first one. So this is just like walking in a zigzag line, trying to find it. It definitely wasn't here, or maybe wasn't, I don't know. It's like they're pretty big zigzags. Could have missed it, could have fallen into a bush, could have been, there's a lot of like dirt bikes and stuff down this road. Somebody could be like, oh, cool, that's that's cool. There was a, a little uh, a sign, I forgot to point it out in the other photo. There's a little, um, like a printed out text message, like a, not text message, a short little explanation of what it was, basically saying, this is not a bomb, this is a high altitude balloon experiment. If you find it, please call me, uh, type of thing on it. Especially after like the clock scare, you kind of want to point that out. So didn't find it there and then uh, decided, well, looks like uh, I didn't go far enough. So I took another path um, and, and walked all the way up here just in case. I was like, well, who knows where it is? <laughs> so, so walked all around looking for it. Um, and I had dinner at my parents' house planned. Um, and I decided just at the last minute, it was uh, maybe like I needed to leave by by four or so, and like about five minutes before um, I, I, I got to my car, I decided to uh, like do like one other big box around it. I can't see my mouse cursor. And I, you can see here where I was doing the, uh, the box heading north towards the other pin. I thought maybe it was there because I hadn't gone far enough. And it turned out to be right, let's see. Oh, found here. Right, come on, show me. Anyway, where that red line ends, that's where it is. So, um, oh, so this is us the previous day, just kind of like <laughs> looking around everywhere and uh, until the end of that day. Um, and then found a balloon, but it's not, it's not the right balloon. It's like a Buzz Lightyear. <laughs> uh, back to Google Earth, I think I was meant to explain all the stuff that I explained before, but now you know the, the punchline. And uh, yeah, saw something orange, took a beeline to it, and, and there it was. Um, so there were some problems with the software. Um, apparently, um, the serial interface I had written for, let's see if I can go to my web browser now. Let me do a quick look at the code. I think this one here. So this is all up on GitHub, the software that runs on it. And this particular piece of code right here under index.js, these are all the sensor readers. So, so sorry, I was talking not into the microphone. You can see the, uh, here we go. The logger, that's fine. This is the, uh, the camera code. Um, the UI, there was kind of a nice ASCII UI, which I ended up turning off because it was useless on the Arduino. Uh, this is the part where it's connecting to the track we know over the, the serial interface. Um, here's a board ready Johnny 5, here's all the things it's setting up. Um, and somewhere down here on the track we know on open and on the data, um, I guess I probably should have done some error checking here or maybe a try catch or something because at some point one of these regexes failed and I just assumed it was there. It was working fine at my house. But apparently like GPS data changes depending on where you are on the earth and so it failed and it was crashing every 13 seconds or so, so there was these like, there was video and there was like these gaps where it just like crash and restart. Luckily I put it in this, in this really not uh, horribly heavy handed, um, yeah, not that one. This little, you know, really useful bash loop to just like restart it. So it was restarting, but instead of like one long video file, there were 360 video files and something like a thousand JSON data files. So it took, quite a while to put all that together and figure out the, the, the missing parts. 
Um, oh, this one's interesting, by the way. This uh, set GPS time. Um, that one worked. That regex did not break because it was simpler. Uh, but basically, the, the Raspberry Pi doesn't have a real-time clock. So if you unplug it, it will it we won't know what time it is. It doesn't have like a battery backup or something. You can buy real-time clock modules. Um, but I thought like since the GPS is sending out the time as well, uh, so before it starts logging data, it's going to wait for the first GPS packet and use it to uh, to extract the time, again, with a really horrible regex here. But it's enough to, to extract out the hours, minutes, and seconds, read the date from a configuration file because the GPS packet doesn't have the date, just the time. And then you call the set date command. So that turned out to be really important for piecing all this together because it meant I had an accurate timestamp on the, the Pi data files. And so I could sort of correlate all, all of the data together, the video and everything. Um, so that was, well, it was, it felt like a miracle that any of the data even made it and there were photos and stuff. And that was the thrill. Um, uh, but because the Raspberry Pi kept resetting, um, that meant that some of the sensors that needed to be calibrated or had some runtime, like the uh, the accelerometer and the gyroscope, um, were almost always wrong. They have a there's a little flag on there called is calibrated, and if it uh, if it runs for a while and you kind of tilt it and it regulates itself, then it'll start calibrating and giving you accurate readings. Um, but because it generally every once in a while it would calibrate, but there wasn't enough data to, for it to be cons consistent and useful, so I had to throw all of that data away, unfortunately. Um, demo time. So, um, oh, there's another thing here that I want to show that was, um, I had to write all these like video conversion scripts and they're all here to just basically piece all these like bunch of MP4 files together and account for the start time of the, the video versus the gap and, and, and create like a JSON file of all the adjustments and factor that into the, into the demo. Um, but this is, let's see if I can enter, how are we doing time-wise? 46 minutes, okay, almost over, but let's enter the presentation mode. Close that guy. Okay, um, so this is the video that was captured. It should have been rewound, but, and let me refresh here. Okay, cool. Um, so this is the video that was captured um, towards the, come on, how do I get rid of that bar? Okay, cool. This is, uh, th this is all basically um, created by synchronizing the JSON data packets uh, with the video frame. So that's the launch right there. You can see the little antenna wagging down below and the road we launched. I think you maybe saw like a fragment of us um, and uh, on the right um, are, are, the, are the data. So the, the barometer, the pressure, and the temperature is working just fine. Uh, we don't have GPS data yet, so the altitude, the course, the speed, and the map positions aren't up to date yet. Um, orientation is the, the electronic compass that's on the unit itself. Um, so it's spinning, and it's basically useless, so it's always spinning, but it is kind of useful uh, to know that um, when the orientation is pointing straight down or 90 degrees on that, then that is the bottom of the screen that the, the camera is facing right there. Um, yeah, so it spins a lot. Um, I'm going to fast forward here a little bit to a more interesting area. You can scrub it and it'll synchronize all the data for you. Oops, okay. Yeah, so here looks like we started tracking it. There's a Google map on the bottom there um, that is tracking the progress, uh, the name of the the, the vessel is called the Nyan Polo one, but like after the Apollo plus Nyan Cat, FYI. Uh, and you can see it being tracked down here uh, over a, a Google Maps view. Um, and we're tracking the, uh, so this is at 16,000 feet right now. And the course, that arrow rotates with CSS sort of pointing at the general direction where it's going. We're getting the, the speed and the temperature. So um, on, the, on the ground level, it was about 90 degrees Fahrenheit. And here at 16,000 feet, it's already 54 degrees. Uh, the barometric pressure there is 50. I think we're at about 90 on ground level as well. Um, and Armstrong's limit starts at, um, I think, 6.25 kilopascals. So keep an eye on that number as well. Uh, you can also calculate the altitude from kilopascals. It's not as accurate, so you'll see it be a little bit different than this one. It doesn't have a histogram either. Um, but it's there just for comparison. 
So I can scrub along and see it spinning, spinning, spinning. There's some interesting, let's see, stuff that happens. It's a little bit bland there, it's still spinning. Um, I think something really dramatic happens at 23 or so. Oh, there you can see the curvature a little bit. That's not super high. It's around 46,000 feet, but there that is. And it's getting really, um, the weather is particularly bad there. So it's getting spun around quite a bit. Let that play for a little bit. Um, it was only a downward uh, facing camera. So it's thanks to this sort of like windy, rough weather that, uh, that we have any curvature of the earth shots. But you can see there, we're sort of flying over a mountain and you see the mountain there. Um, there was a certain frame I paused that. I was like, that is the exact mountain from Google Earth. We use Google Earth. We'll just do our own. Um, there it goes. Here, now it's getting tossed around a lot. And I think any second now. Mm, there's that piece of cardboard that just came off. <laughs> Spinning, looks like a... Ah, there it goes. There it goes. And I think it falls off somewhere. Uh, there, we're free and we're on some death spin now. Um, but it's still, it's, still, it's still ascending. You can see from the histogram, we're only at about uh, 50,000 feet. So you can scrub to probably the, the highest point, which is right here at 98,000 feet. It's pretty calm up here. You can see pretty much all of Las Vegas below. And then 90, uh, 98, 650, 98, oh, I actually scrubbed backwards. Oh, now it's descending. Okay, now the histogram is trending down, so it's falling, falling, falling. And you can just scrub through the entire sequence. Oh, that's really cool. That's, uh, that's sort of a, a, a dry lake bed, oh, right here. And a, and a massive, um, and sort of see where that is on Google Maps versus here, uh, a big dry lake bed in this massive solar power plant. So, oh, and there it is, it landed. I don't know if we can do the touchdown here. I think I'm over time. So, um, yeah, I think I'll, oh, I should go back and do the final slides, demo time. Okay, lessons learned. Sorry, don't have time. But uh, basically the links for the project are here. Um, if you're interested, uh, github.com slash makanai slash nyanpolo is the link to, uh, to, to, uh, to, to this project. And eventually I'll have a detailed blog post for how to do things or follow me on, on Twitter. And uh, yeah, sorry for going over, but thanks everyone.